Formula One is a performance game. If you can do something that will get you performance on your car, you're going to do it. And if that means doing something extreme, then so be it. Which has, on some occasions, led to complaints that the cars don't look pretty enough. The 2014 fingers that appeared on a lot of the cars, for instance. And these were a conscious design choice by the likes of Caterham, Force India and Toro Rosso, because the rules said the nose had to be a minimum length. The teams had the noses stopped just before the front wing began, because that allowed more air to be shoved through the central part of the front wing and increased front end downforce, which had been largely taken away in 2014. The finger was just to comply with the rulebook, since there was no rule saying that the nose had to be a certain shape. People complained about the looks of the finger noses then and they still complain about them now, but your feelings are, well sadly, irrelevant. The teams aren't designing the cars and having somebody else come along afterwards and going, whoa lads, we can't use this because somebody on YouTube in 11 years will be crying that it's ugly. The same goes for the step noses in 2012 and actually into 2013 as well. The FIA said that the nose had to be a certain height, so the teams did the whole step nose thing simply to comply with the regulations and get gains in downforce and other aero bits and pieces. Did they look odd? Yes. Did it gain them 0.0000097 of a second? Also, yes. So they're going to do it. But it's not just the aesthetics of the cars because the engineers will be doing absolutely anything to gain a performance advantage, including but not limited to shoving things through the engine that they otherwise shouldn't be shoving. And this is something that's been going on for, well, a long time, if not forever. Cast your minds back to last year, if you were watching this channel back then. I think it was last year. No, actually it was last year I did the video around this time in July. The video where I looked at the Brabham BT52 and the time that they, or we? Can I actually say we? Use something that's become known as rocket fuel. And it's one of my favourite videos that I've done in the last year and a bit, simply because of the lengths that Brabham went to just to gain that extra performance. And it was also a fun video because it cleared up some confusion as to what went on with that particular car and that particular hack that they used. Because the story of the Brabham BT-52 and that rocket fuel is a bit like the Mazda 787B, where it's, that's not what happened at all. So just as a recap, and it really is relevant to the main story, so do bear with me here for at least another couple of minutes or so, Brabham had a problem with detonation in the engine and they needed something that was going to reduce that detonation as much as possible. Their fuel supplier in Winterschall was a subsidiary company of BASF, a company that did some, um, we'll call it contractual work for a mid 20th century German dictatorship. Brabham called them up and said, have you got anything that's going to stop this detonation problem we've got? And BASF went, yeah. Long story short, BASF delivered 200 litres of this new fuel to Brabham. They put it in the car, it went out, and they got more power while reducing the whole detonation thing. Renault was not particularly happy about this because they believed that the title should have been Prost, but it was won instead by PK, and Renault believed that the fuel that Brabham was using was illegal. Now just as a quick aside, because I've taken up too much of your time with this other story, the whole rocket fuel myth is perpetuated because people have put two and two together and somehow got nine. Now I know my maths is terrible, but this takes the biscuit. Because what you'll see online is that Brabham was using actual rocket fuel, a claim that is utterly ridiculous because the V2s were powered by alcohol and liquid oxygen. That's not working in an internal combustion engine. I think what happened is, people saw that BASF was doing fuel stuff for the Third Reich, and they happened to have this high octane stuff lying around. And because BASF did work for the Nazis, and Brabham called this stuff rocket fuel, that's where the myth came from. Put simply, rocket fuel was a nickname, the same way that party mode was a nickname, and not some extra secret power setting that only Mercedes had on their engines. Rocket fuel was just this stuff that made the Brabham go faster because it had more combustion or stuff to that effect, I'll leave a link for the original video, in the same way that party mode was just another way of saying turning it up to 11. Party mode was the Mercedes run at max power, it was not a secret setting that only they had. Got that? Good, we'll move on. Speaking of Mercedes, and I know, brilliant segue, this leads us all back to where we need to be, because like the rocket fuel thing, today's video is about teams chasing performance by doing stuff with the engines, all in the name of getting more power. 
because if you have more power, you'll be faster in a straight line. And if you have more power, you can run more downforce, because the power will offset the drag caused by running higher wing angles. Or have a completely aerodynamically efficient car, and good god you'll reap the benefits. And it's no secret that at the start of the hybrid era, the Mercedes was the car to beat. Not only was it on rails more than any other car on the grid, and it also didn't help that it was being driven by prime Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg, with Rosberg being a seriously underrated driver by all counts, but during the 2016 season, things started coming out in the media that caused a bit of a fuss, because Mercedes was alleged to be doing some tricks with the engine that might have been the secret to their extra power all along. Red Bull were the ones who blew the whistle, although this might have been done at the urging of Renault, who, until Honda came along, had the worst engine. Mercedes shook their collective heads and denied they were doing anything of the sort, while pointing at Ferrari and saying that it was them doing it instead. Ferrari went, nah mate, not us, we've just brought some new engine mappings for this year and that's where our performance has come from. In Italian. Thankfully, a man called Judge13 on an internet has done a detailed breakdown of all of this. I'm going to try and simplify it for you, but I'll leave a link to his thing in the description so you can read that whenever you like. It starts within the internal combustion engine, using something called jet ignition, apparently. Using a spark plug like you would in my 2006 Vauxhall Corsa, it won't do enough to produce the power required. This uses about five extra sparks doing various bits and pieces that ignites the lean mix of fuel in the engine more efficiently. Instead of igniting a small portion of the fuel vapour, it ignites a lot more, if not all of the vapour, and you get more power produced with less wasted vapour being sent out into the atmosphere. What this basically means is you get more power from less fuel because you're burning all of it and not only some of it. And with the fuel flow in Formula 1 being very tightly regulated, you need to burn as much as you possibly can and not waste any at all, if you can. It means that the engine control units are working overtime. But if you get all the mappings right, you reap the benefits, as Mercedes were doing. Get those mappings wrong and you're causing knock-on effects for the entire hybrid ecosystem which is partly what was happening with Honda and all the failures that they were having. Although that said, I do need to look into the second Honda years at some point because those years were, well, an embarrassment for Honda, but hilarious for the rest of us. But when it was all out in the open, the FIA was very quick to remind all the teams that using additives to improve performance was illegal. Tyrrell turning their cars into 160 mile an hour shotguns springs to mind. What Mercedes and also Ferrari, because they too had jumped on the bandwagon, were doing was they were using less viscous oil and putting that oil and only that oil into the combustion chamber. The other regular stuff did as you'd expect, so they'd have that for normal lubrication purposes, but the less viscous stuff was, like mentioned, directly inside the engine. Ferrari and Mercedes were so far ahead of the competition in this aspect, and Renault reportedly said it would cost them 5 million euros just to be able to do the same thing and they weren't going to justify the spend. So why not get it all banned instead? It worked when the teams overspent over-engineering their own fiddle brakes in 1997 into 1998, for instance. What the oil burning was doing was allowing Mercedes and Ferrari to bypass the fuel flow rate rule that the FIA had implemented for the start of the 2014 season, the rule that got Daniel Ricciardo disqualified from the Australian Grand Prix that year. By using oil as part of the overall system and storing up to six liters of it in a separate tank, they could feed this into the piston rings, doing the job of lubricating things up, but because of the oil's construction, it combusted along with the fuel, resulting in more power. And Mercedes were never punished because technically they'd not broken any rules. It didn't say anything about oil burning anywhere in the technical regulations, so they just kept on doing it. After the Canadian Grand Prix of 2017, the teams running Ferrari engines, so Taas, Sauber and Ferrari, were found to have had a metric boatload of oil residue in the exhaust systems. This violated Technical Directive 00417 that was issued in the off-season between 2016 and 2017. A technical directive that basically said, if you are found to be running two types of oil, this would be considered deliberate combusting of oil against the regulations. But because the FIA still had some engineering-minded people in the organisation at this point, they went, okay, this would actually happen anyway because that's how an engine works, so we'll allow a maximum burn for 2017. That maximum burn being 5 litres across the entirety of a Grand Prix. But after the Azerbaijan Grand Prix of 2017, which was the race after Canada, the FIA clarified the technical directive that they released during the winter. Nothing except petrol goes into the engine. You make your power from the petrol, and nothing else. 
and they would once again consider additional components or substances in oil for the purposes of enhancing combustion as a breach of the technical regulations. Motorsport magazine at the time hypothesized that this might be because Ferrari was using two different oil types, one for lubricating the engine and one for supplementing power. But there was one more stipulation added to the rulebook. Up to the Canadian Grand Prix, they were allowed to burn 5 litres through the course of a Grand Prix, after which the rate was cut down to 1.2 litres per 100 kilometres. After Monza, any new engine that was introduced had to run 0.9 litres per 100 kilometres. I'm not converting that into American. So this would fix everything, right? Well, not necessarily, because there was then some confusion. Ferrari, understandably, went to the FIA and went, Hey, um, Jean, why is this coming in for Monza? Why can't it be brought in now? The FIA said, Look, you have to understand that this is something to do with the very thing that makes your car go vroom, so we're giving you, Mercedes, Honda and Renault a chance to make sure that everything is okay. And if they are also doing anything, it means they can sort out any issues, because we don't know what this is going to do for reliability, because you might have built your engines entirely around this oil burning stuff. So Ferrari went, okay, yeah, understood. <laughs> it's not like anybody's going to bring a new spec of engine before then. It's too soon after the last engines were brought in for Canada. <laughs> Mercedes brought a new specification of engine for Spa, the race before the Italian Grand Prix. Remember that this rule is for new specifications of engines, not actual new engines. If Renault, Ferrari and Honda brought their new specs for Monza, which was most likely given the nature of the track, they would have had to have complied with the new 0.9 litres per 100 km rule. Mercedes on the other hand had gone, oh wow, we've got our new engine done already. When does that new rule come in? Monza? Oh okay, we might as well use it at Spa. Because Mercedes had brought in their new specification of engine early, you know, before the Italian Grand Prix, they were able, under a loophole, allowed to keep on using the old flow rate of 1.2 litres per 100 kilometres. Everybody else who brought their engines after Monza had to comply with the new rule. Ferrari had to then somehow improve performance while burning less oil, because their new engine coming in at Monza would be under the new regulations that Mercedes had dodged. Mercedes had yanked Ferrari's trousers down and left them feeling like they'd been sucker punched. Ferrari was anticipating everybody being even out a bit at Monza, but Mercedes was now going to have quite the engine advantage and Ferrari was now on the back foot. With the title fight on between Hamilton and Vettel, it meant that they had to do something to stay competitive. I know I said Mercedes finished their engine early and got it into service early, but did they accelerate their engine program on the off chance that Ferrari was going to try and do the same thing? Answers on a postcard. Remember as well, just 12 months or so after this story takes place, Ferrari would be under investigation from the other teams and later the FIA for trying something else to try and improve performance. I've already done a full video on it, but it started at the Canadian Grand Prix of 2018, where Ferrari had debuted their second spec of engine, and there was something a bit iffy about it. That warp speed boost that it got around 130 miles an hour or so, that was giving it an edge in the areas around the exit of the hairpin and the exit of the chicane. Vettel trounced everybody at that race, and this later led to the FIA slapping the second sensor on Ferrari's twin battery system. While the twin battery setup was totally legal and likely done for weight distribution, it's alleged that Ferrari wasn't sending 60 kilowatts from each battery, which would have been regulation, to create the maximum boost of 120 kilowatts. More, they would be sending 60 through the sensor because anything more would have been picked up by the FIA immediately, and maybe 65, 70 from the other battery that wasn't being policed. And some of the most knowledgeable people in the motorsport media were thinking that when everybody brought their new engines at Monza, everything would be sorted out and everybody would be a little bit closer and it might knock Mercedes back a little bit. But when Mercedes brought that new engine at Spa, it meant that the new regulations did absolutely nothing. Hamilton won the next three races at Spa, Monza and Singapore. Although that Singapore win came from seemingly nowhere, and he was helped a bit by Vettel taking himself out along with Raikkonen, Verstappen and Alonso at the start, allowing Hamilton to sneak on through the carnage and take an unlikely win. It was an unlikely win. That Mercedes was so far off the pace that weekend. This is an observation based off lap times. But the Ferrari of Vettel then had another problem in Japan, losing one of the spark plugs which might have been a result of Ferrari trying to do something with the engine to generate more power. We don't know. But it happened. 
and as a result Hamilton won at Suzuka and at Austin on his way to what became his fourth world title. So the FIA had to change the all burning rules again for 2018. This is starting to sound like the villain in one of those Saturday morning cartoons that we watched as kids. I'll get you next time, He-Man! Despite Toto saying that he thought Horner and Renault were seeing ghosts, the FIA decided that they wanted to really clamp down on things. Mercedes had seen their supposed 6 litre tank drop to 5 litres and then this 1.2 litre per 100 kilometre rule brought in. But for the 2018 regulations, the World Motorsport Council said that the level of the tanks in the cars must be available to the FIA at all times. So the FIA can see in real time if there's an anomaly in the burning of the oil. This being done to stop the teams firing more oil through the system to be used as an overtaking boost or a supplement to Mercedes' so-called party mode. In addition, the teams must now tell the FIA how much oil they're putting in the cars at least one hour before the race. Furthermore, any active control valves between the power units and the air intakes would now be outlawed, and the sump breather pipes that fed the excess oil back through the engine to supplement power would be changed to be going out the back of the car instead, to prevent any engine manufacturers coming up with any clever systems to somehow siphon the excess oil back through the engine like they were doing in 2016 and 17. The final thing was that the FIA now restricted the teams to just one type of oil per race, to stop them putting something in for qualifying and then something in for the actual Grand Prix. The oil burning saga was certainly controversial, but these things always are when it's not your team doing it. Like the double diffuser for instance, it was protested because Red Bull didn't have one. The fiddle brake was protested because Ferrari didn't have one. And that's not me picking on individual teams, that's what happened. Ron Dennis said it himself when the fiddle brake was banned because it's easier and cheaper to have something outlawed than to make one yourself. If it slows the other team down for free, then you do it all day long. Don't hate the players, hate the game. But what you can't deny is that it was bloody clever. And that's what's so great about Formula 1. There's been hundreds, and we are probably talking hundreds of times, where the people building the cars have been smarter than the people making the rules. And this translates over to NASCAR as well with Smokey Eunuch, who is a fascinating character if you don't know anything about him. The NASCAR rulebook is what it is because of Smokey. The NASCAR rulebook went from a small pamphlet to a phone book because of Smokey simply saying, look, you can bitch all you want, but find me in here where it says I can't do this. The exploitation of loopholes is what makes Formula 1 what it is. I've covered many of them over the years and I think at some point I do need to remake the Brabham fan car video because it really was a rule bender, simply because of Gordon Murray thinking ahead of the curve. But we'll be on to the next piece of rule bending incredibly soon with the 2026 regulations. The claims of water in the tyres hasn't gone anywhere recently but like I said there might be something else that might be protested next year. And actually a regulation reset is the perfect time to find these kinds of hacks and see what the other teams are going to protest simply because they don't have one of their own. So I wonder where we're going to end up next year and how many videos we're going to be doing about this kind of stuff. So then a look at the oil burning trickery that happened over the course of 2016 and 17 and how the FIA tried to stop it and how teams exploited the rules before they even came into effect which was you know banter. If this has been a fun look through the motorsport history books then do give the video a like so I know I've done a good job and for more stuff like this from the channel get subscribed and also get the bell on so you never miss out on anything else that I do around here. Massive thanks as ever go out to the rad lads at Patreon for the continued support and if you want to help out with picture purchasing or any other bits and pieces there'll be a link to Patreon in the description along with links to Discord, socials, affiliates and any other bits and bobs you might want or need to know. Or the super thanks if you just want to top up my coffee cup and memberships so you can do Patreon without the Patreon. There's also some stuff on the F1 store in the run-up to the British Grand Prix if you want to get in on the collections for that, there will be a link in the description. So with all that out of the way, I've been Aidan Moord, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. Goodbye.